Thank you for joining us in this workshop. I am Mehnaz Khairandish, Regional Advisor for Evidence and Data to Policy with two colleagues, Dr. Arash Rashidian, Director for Science, Information and Dissemination, and Dr. Ahmed Mandir, Coordinator for Research and Innovation uh, from WHO Regional Office for Eastern Mediterranean. We will be with you for one and a half hours. And in this short workshop, we will try to address the main key topics for policy brief, which is the key tool for making policies informed by evidence. So uh, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you are invited to use question and answer box or chat box. We will have uh, the session at the end of this um, workshop, uh, which will be moderated by Dr. Mandir to address your comments. Thank you again for attending this workshop. I, I want to hand over to Dr. Arash Ashidian, Director for Science Information Dissemination, WHO EMRO, for the first presentation. Um, over to you, Dr. Arash. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Hernandez. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know, for some people, it could be also morning. So good morning to those as well. So it's a pleasure to be with you. I see. It's been a long day in the conference already, depending on when you joined, but I've noted some of the names that were in the first session we had today are still on, online, so that's excellent. So as Dr. Khairanish mentioned, so we are focusing on uh, uh, to reviewing the policy brief requirements. So the presentations are in the format of workshops of focusing on practicalities, but unfortunately due to time and also the venue is not, we are not conducting it. So we are not giving tasks to you. We are hoping that you will engage with questions. Otherwise we are hoping that uh, given that we are raising practical issues, it could be useful for you in any case. So I'm sharing my slide sets now. So I'm giving the first presentation. And uh, so it's on, the screen more so can someone confirm that you can see my yes. presentation yes thank you okay many thanks okay so i mean in a way i'm looking in this in this presentation i'm looking at policy beliefs as a tool for supporting evidence informed policy making and within the talk i try to cover few key points each one of them briefly and but trying to give a sort of the main aspects of it. So first, I will start with the, uh, a format for categorizing policymakers' key questions, and I use the format to uh, frame policy brief as a tool to support answering those questions. Then a quick reference with the framework uh, for use of. Uh, Evidence in policy making and institutionalizing capacity at national level, and then locating policy brief agenda within that framework that the WHO has. Then going to the challenges that we often hear from uh, policymakers, especially when they want to uh, use evidence informed approaches for uh, their decisions and policies. And lastly, sort of going back to the issue of uh, how policy brief can address different stages of policy making processes. So in a way, in this presentation, I mean, each element of the presentation has re requires some background knowledge about certain areas. We are not covering those background, background knowledge, but uh, uh, I'm also hoping that the way that you are presenting the, my, in, in my talk, I'm referring to the key concepts. So even if you don't know the background knowledge about those elements, hopefully the message will be clear in the end. Okay, so as a short uh, and maybe a brief categorization of the key questions that the policymaker may ask. So, I mean, the question can be identified in four groups. One is that when the policymakers ask about what priorities they need to address, I mean, in any given time, I mean, in any given society, when it comes to health related questions, there are certain issues that are of priority to the policymaker. So whether I look at, for example, uh, resolving challenges with, uh, related to the pandemic, and within that, I mean, what would be the main issues that I'm uh, addressing? So uh, 
Uh, is it about, for example, enhancing vaccination program? Is it about in implementing social processes? Is it about uh, sort of supporting hospital sector to provide a better service? Is it about making sure the primary care has a role? Is it about making sure my routine so resources, uh, my, my routine, routine services are not hampered? Let's say the normal vaccination program has not been affected. So that's during the pandemic, and I can add to this question. You may answer saying that all of these are priorities. You may be right. And uh, in normal situation, I mean, the, the sort of when there is no emergency in the country, but I see there are many questions related to budget, to expansion, to response that are there. But while all of them are priorities, but not all of them probably would take much of uh, uh, attention of a policymaker. So what are the issues that should be the focus of attention of a policymaker? Or if I'm supporting a minister of health, what should be the issues that I bring to the attention of the policymaker? So policy, so that's one thing. So what would be the main problem I'm going to address? The second is the main question is that, okay, so I have a problem at hand or a priority that I need to address. What is the solution for that problem? How am we going to address those uh, policy concerns? And uh, if there are uh, solutions for that, which solutions are the most effective solutions to the problem? So let's say, I want to reduce uh, distribution or reduce the transmission of disease, let's say the coronavirus in the society, what would be the safe, the best safe and effective option to do that? So I, mean, I, I can have social measures, it's about personal protection issues, it's about the vaccination program, it's about changes in the, how the government is being run. So, I mean, it's about uh, restriction of movement. Could be many aspects. It's about re reshaping the way the communal, communal uh, building work. Which one of them is more effective? Which one of them is the same? And then obviously immediately comes to your mind is that which one of them is more costly? And depending on how much money I spend, which one of them results in better uh, solutions? So cost effectiveness or affordability of the, the intervention itself becomes the, the second, the third question. So when we talk of cost effectiveness is that if I spend so much money on a solution, well, how much result I get out of it? Is it worth the investment I'm making? Affordability is about do I have enough resources to implement it, even if it is cost effective? So let's say if, I, if I'm a student, imagine if I buy a good computer, it's cost effective for me because it makes my life much easier. I can, uh, for example, run my software much better, much easier. That's cost effective. But if I, do I have enough money to buy that better computer or not? That's about affordability. So cost effectiveness and affordability are linked to each other, but not the same question. And policymakers sometimes, they cannot use the cost effective options because the cost effective option may not be affordable to the society. And lastly is that which one of them are doable, easier to implement, which one of them matches the existing situation in the society? What would be the, re the reaction of people, public, to the uh, solutions I'm having? Can I implement it? So just think of, again, I mean, I'm making examples of related to COVID because it's all close to all our minds. There were so many policies. Not all of them were accepted by the society. Not all of them were implemented as good as the others in any given country. And that change differed from one country to the other. So these are the questions that policymaker has in mind, a policymaker has in mind is that, so if I select this policy option, will it be possible to be implemented or not? For every category of question, I mean, every uh, question within each, each of these four categories, ideally policymakers need to look at evidence. Sometimes the evidence is the experience they, they, or they hear from others or past experience. What we, we would recommend is that they should be looking at the evidence coming from research, robust research evidence coming from data. And that, that's not an easy thing. And the sources of information, the sources of evidence vary uh, one way or the other. One major source would be data, household surveys and the routine information that is collected through the health system. We heard in, if some of you, for those of you who attended the earlier session, 
the case studies that uh, we had on use of evidence to respond to COVID, we saw many of the countries in many case studies, uh, the data from survey or data from this information system was a major source of evidence for action. These are usually these data help to address most of these questions. But then when it comes to selecting effective solutions and cost effectiveness of those solutions, usually we look at interventional studies, randomized control trials, for example, field trials, assessment, uh, economic evaluation studies. So those are the sort of evidence that uh, help us understand which one is whether option A is more effective than option B. And then also qualitative studies, when we ask of opinion of, opinion of people, attitude of people would help us to, to identify the uh, um, priorities. It also helps us to understand what works and what does not work, what is feasible and what is not feasible. So those, I mean, different types of evidence help answer different key questions. And obviously for any type of evidence, we are talking about different methods, different sources of evidence, and different ways of categorizing those. And some of these discussions will be part of the presentation that I'm going to recommend you make later today. So we know that, I mean, evidence related to those different source is not easy to find. Sometimes may not be reliable. Sometimes the answers are not relevant, or maybe it's not reaching to the policy in a timely manner. A tool that can help in that process, all those elements is possible. So policy it actually can be developed in a way using different sources of evidence and answering different types of policymakers question. And that's why they are important. That's why they matter. Obviously, all of that matter if policymakers, policy beliefs are developed correctly, with use of valid data, with recommendations that are useful to the policymakers. And that will be the focus of the presentation that uh, Dr. Heranich will make uh, later uh, as part of this workshop. Okay, and then we know, I mean, sort of in many countries, that's definitely the case for countries in our region, in the Mediterranean region, but also many other areas of the world, especially in low and middle income countries, the capacity to generate policy briefs in a timely manner that is good quality as needed by the person that is not is limited, it is not adequate. And then also similarly, I mean, there's technology assessments, development of uh, evidence-based uh, evidence clinical or public health guidelines, et cetera. So all of that requires capacity generation and uh, resources for the country. Okay, so again, Referring to the four questions I mentioned, but then we know the policymakers work in, a, in an environment that is affected by, uh, by several factors. So one way of describing policy processes is the, uh, the, the conceptualization that uh, Jill Walt and uh, Lucy Gilson made many years ago that has become uh, famous as a policy triangle is that so that when we, if I think of a policy as a triangle, there are different corners or different angles of the policy uh, uh, making issues that are affected by the, say, the context in which it, uh, the policy is being developed, what's happening in the country, um, where, what is the situation, let's say economic situation, is that emergency or not, what is the political issues in terms of demand on this uh, policy making process. What is the content of the policy? What is the technical elements included in the policy? What are the processes in policy making uh, in, in the country? So who makes the decision? Who has the power to make the decision? Who, I mean, what's the role of the parliament? How is the Ministry of Health making the decisions? I mean, what next stage should be happening? And then national level, regional level, all those elements that it is in every country. And then in any of these issues, there are actors, there are policymakers, there are individuals that have a role. So all of these affect policymaking process. So for any of those questions that I'm referring to. But then these are not the only thing that affects policymakers. So I mean, in, the, in many countries, there are social values that affect policymaking process, they affect decisions. These social values are we are also related to the perception that people have. For example, what would, uh, is it okay to mandate wearing of mask or not? Remember the discussions that we had around the world. If you say vaccination is compulsory, 
is it a good thing? Is the policymaker allowed to make that recommendation or not? So I mean, we know that most countries they answered this question saying that yes, but then several countries they didn't answer it as they did a yes question. So those social values or the interpretation of social values by policymakers and politicians or by the society as a whole uh, is an important factor. But there are also conflicts of interest. People might have, I mean, uh, say, I mean, financial interests, political interests that they may have their policy making. And then the lobbyism and also political pressure could become a factor in policy making process. So when we talk of how a policymaker answers questions, this is the real context. I mean, this is a very simple and simplification of uh, the context in which a policymaker makes their decision. So again, what we would love to see is that the policy brief can help a policymaker uh, to make these things more visible, more transparent, and also address them in, in the right way. Okay, so now I'm moving to the just a very quick note on the framework for improving national institutional capacity for evidence informed policy in our region. In the, uh, sorry, I say our region because it's a global conference in the Eastern Mediterranean region. I think that uh, the approach can be applicable to uh, everywhere. So I mean, just find it acceptable. So this is this was approved approved by the ministers of health of the region in 2019, October 2019, in the regional committee. And so the, the one virtue of this approach is that it brings different sources of or different routes for evidence from policymaking together under one umbrella: knowledge translation processes. Health technology assessment, guidelines, routine data, survey, and as well as other ad hoc studies and monitoring and evaluation processes. All different sources of evidence coming together for evidence informed policy making. So, in a way, that the approach calls for integrated approach, integrated multi concept approach. I'm not going to explain that, but simply put, put, put it simply is that bringing everything together so that the programs are linked or talking to each other and they support national decision making. And then there are some requirements by that impact approach. So realizing everything happens in, a, in an ecosystem, the context that I referred to earlier, there are systematic links between those programs and those programs are coherent in a process. So again, these are described in the technical paper behind the approach and it's available to interested individuals and also in the, the additional resources, we have uh, many resources made available in terms of uh, also uh, technical papers. Technical presentation if colleagues are interested. Okay, within that framework, there is a very clear role, role for policy briefs. So I mean, the, the framework talks about that which is support for member states. And that's one of the, uh, the areas of support is developing policy briefs at all in areas of need for um, more than one country. So it is at the topic that applicable to several countries of the region. Then WHO has committed itself to develop policy briefs to support countries in developing policy briefs. There are work happening in these areas, so that's not the focus of our talk, but that's a major uh, factor that we have. For, uh, for countries affected, uh, countries with limited academic resources, WHO is also uh, has made the commitment that support them directly in developing policy briefs uh, for, uh, for the national countries that we have. So there are examples of that going. And then countries affected by emergency, obviously developing rapid processes, rapid response processes for uh, answering the policymaker questions, especially if the country, because of emergency, had lost some of the resources that they need to function the way they, 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 they can function in response to the needs of the society. Okay, so. Uh, this is the, I mean, the second part of my talk. So referring to the framework, I put the policy uh, in the context of what's happening uh, by the WHO, at least in, uh, in one region, but this is applicable for other regions of WHO as well. So let's go back to policymakers again. So policymakers usually, when we, they discuss in evidence informed policymaking, when they sort of, they challenge it, they have some, common concerns that you see them in many literature, you see them also in the talks of the policymakers, and a lot of solutions are turned to address these challenges. One is that so often evidence coming uh, based on research studies is not uh, relevant 
for understanding of the policy context of the real policy that is happening. So the research of yesterday may not answer the context of today or may not be relevant to that. Or it is happening in another country, it may not be relevant to this. Or I'm focused on a policy that is specific while the research answers are generalized. The issue of time, I cannot wait for the evidence to come or the evidence summary is not reaching me when I need it. Often policymakers talking of needing the answer yesterday. And so as such becomes a challenge. Issues of evidence not being available. So yes, I mean, I'm looking for evidence, but I don't find it or what is offered to me is not relevant to my context. And the issues of how, I mean, yes, I'm, I believe in evidence informed policymaking, but I need to address political pressure. I need to address the lobbies, I need to address media, et cetera, et cetera, that they, those requirements may not, or those demands may not be in line with the evidence. Okay, so how these things can be addressed better? So, I mean, obviously these questions are real questions and the fact that they have remained all the time and they're raised again and again, it shows that these are valid questions, valid concerns. Obviously, it doesn't mean that they are a sort of uh, um, sort of they, they cannot be addressed, or everyone every time we talk about, for example, one of these concerns is exactly the same thing. It's not. It differs from one policy to the other. It differs from one time to the other. It differs from one country to the other. But there are roots and uh, solutions for this. Source. One one is that through communication and dialogue with policymaker, with the society and helping that to also with those behind the evidence and those behind the policy to make that more uh, uh, sort of bringing a more uh, common language. Policy belief is a tool for such a communication. The other issue is lack of time. So yes, lack of time is, is a reality, but there is a difference between perceived lack of time and reality of lack of, lack of time. Very often, I mean, the, the political pressure to give an answer is not necessarily meaning that, I mean, the answer should be implemented fully today. It's more about making an overall decision why the details can be worked out later. So if the sort of those who support policymaking processes realize this situation, they, are, they can help the policymaker to answer the questions of today today, while keeping the key questions that require more evidence for tomorrow and then buying time or finding the time needed for the work on the best evidence. So let's say you want to say, this is my direction for the country, fine, you say that, but how we are going to apply it at different parts of the country, for that you need more time. And obviously, even if you decide today, you cannot implement it today in any country. So that gives time for the evidence to come forward. So, uh, and also on lack of evidence, etc. So, so a policy brief can actually also help to make these concerns transparent. So if you are under pol political pressure, policy brief can, can hi highlight those political pressure, can put them in writing, make it clear to others. And also in that sense, by making them transparent can also help alleviate the problems where possible. So in a, in a way, the, this, when we talk about agency for policy making, we are not making uh, sort of saying that all oh, no, these, these concerns are not real. We actually acknowledge these concerns are real. The point is how to try to resolve them in a way that uh, more evidence can be used in the right way at the policy makers. Let's look at the issue from another angle. So as I mentioned, as uh, sort of referring to the policy triangles, policy processes are uh, context is specific, they are policy actor dependent, and they may vary over time in the society and also in the country as well as across the countries. There is something very well known in terms of uh, in policymaking literature. So you've probably heard of policymaking stages. And uh, so this, this language is not just limited to health policymaking it's in any public policy process. Some of you that are, have worked in areas of I mean, management or quality processes, quality improvement process, you are also familiar with similar terminology. When we talk about stages, you are actually also simplifying the process. So I understand that I'm not going to practice those complexities. So let's look at that in a simplified way. What is the problem I'm going to address? What is my agenda as a priority? What is the solution, the policy formulation? How is it going to be implemented? And how am I going to evaluate whether the policy implementation resulted in the objectives 
that have been set uh, for policy. Did, did I reach my objectives? Did I manage to resolve my questions to alleviate my concerns as a policymaker for my society and improving health, responding to the needs of the society? It's also about monitoring and information. So in a way, when we talk of the stages, we are talking on all the stages sometimes as people who support policymakers or we're in academic circles, you see a lot of focus is on making the decision on what should be done or getting how to do it and how to assess the impact. However, policy briefs can actually address all four steps. So policy briefs are not just for the initial decision, they can help the implementation processes. They can actually also address the evaluation. So that's really important. And that's again, part of the elements when you, you listen just shortly to Dr. Khairandi, she will refer how these elements can be incorporated in a short policy brief that is helpful to decision makers. So, I mean, by that, I go back to my initial uh, slide in the presentation. Four categories of questions by policymakers. What is the policy? What is the priority for policy? What would be the effective solution for that concern? Which options are more cost effective and affordable to the society? Which options are feasible among those that are more cost effective and affordable? So then using policy to address those. And with that, I stop my presentation. Uh, handing over to Dr. Kheranish, but I see also a question. Let me check whether the question should be answered now. Okay, yeah, they are asking. I mean, I see that uh, Zohra Mohammadi has uh, um, asked about sort of examples. So I mean, those examples can be shared later. Um, okay, so I stop here, uh, Dr. Kheranish, back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashidian, for the great presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Ahmad Mandil, uh, Coordinator for Research and Innovation at the WHO Regional Office for Eastern Mediterranean Region, for his kind presentation. Dr. Ahmad Mandil, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, 